everyone. Welcome to church this morning. Welcome to East Church in Benidorm. It's lovely to see you all today. Lovely to see the church uh, filling up and other people will come and join us, I'm sure, as we go. Welcome to beautiful Benidorm. Anyone on holiday right now? Put your hands up. Lovely to see you all. You're so welcome. Anyone live here all year round? Okay, wonderful. Are those of you on holiday jealous and envious of those who live here all year round? <laughs> don't be, don't be, don't be. It's not like that. Okay. Listen, God bless you. Thank you. This is the English Church in uh, Benidorm. As you know, we call ourselves the English Church because we are English speaking. And you need to know a few things about us up front. We are an evangelical church, so we teach the Bible. Uh, we are an international church. We are a church of many different nationalities. Uh, who uh, minister and worship in the English language mostly. Um, we are non-denominational. We have a trap, have people here from all kinds of denominational uh, backgrounds. We would want to encourage you to be part of our family. And so when you return to the United Kingdom, you can become a partner of our church, a part of our church by, uh, by uh, watching our services and praying for us on a regular uh, basis. Uh, I would like to know this morning how many nationalities we have here. We often do this. Where are you from? So I'm going to need someone to count this for me because I always get confused with this. All right. But anyone here from England this morning? Yes. Well done. That's one. Scotland? Yeah. <laughs> Wales? Yes. Northern Ireland? <laughs> Northern Ireland. So miserable. <laughs> I'm from Northern Ireland. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Philippines? Yes. yes. Iceland? Yes. Colombia? Yes. Spain? Yes. <laughs> Holland? Yes. <laughs> How many is that? Nine. Nine? Nine. Okay. USA? Uh, USA? USA? That's a double counter, Esther, Holland, and yes, I love it. Yeah. Um, Belgium, of course. <laughs> Norway. Yes. yes. Oh. How many is that? Twelve. Oh. Well, and have I missed anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Germany. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Anyway, you are so welcome. Um, uh, we're, we worship here on this little, in this little building, on um, Tory Prince Zapato here in Benidorm. We raise up a witness for the Lord Jesus. We honor his name in our singing and in our preaching and teaching. Uh, we're very grateful to our friends in the Scandinavian church uh, whose building this is, and we're just tenants of this building. We rent this building from them. And we're grateful to them for their partnership and for their uh, support. We are looking on Sunday mornings at a series of Bible teaching from the last chapters in the book of Genesis. And we're looking at a man in the Bible called Joseph. We're looking at his life, his ups and downs and highs and lows. And we're learning what we can for our lives today in the 21st century. In this service, you will have an opportunity later on to give an offering uh, to the work of the Lord here in Benidorm. Because we believe it's an important part of our worship experience, not just we sing and listen, but we also give to God's work. And if, uh, when you return to the United Kingdom, you want to keep giving to the English Church in Benidorm, you can certainly do that in a small monthly gift at <coughs> EnglishChurchBenidorm.com, which really helps us uh, keep the witness going here in this part of Benidorm. We are going to have some tea and coffee this morning. You're welcome to join us uh, for that. This week we have our Bible study as usual on Wednesday. We've been going through the commandments. We've been learning a lot, I think, haven't we? Those of us who have been there about what God's requirements are for us. And then we have a wonderful time around the Lord's table every Friday at 11 o'clock. And I'm sure you will agree that we have sensed God's presence in all of those services for which we are very grateful. Our ladies are going to meet this week on Wednesday and in the afternoon they're going to go to Camping Villamar and they're going to ask you to bring your own picnic, enjoy a game of Patonk, which is kind of like this thing, isn't it? Yeah. And any of you ladies are more than welcome to join in with that. Uh, Maggie will send out the details to those of you who are in that connect group 
and you will hear all the details of that. But please be free to ask if you're not sure. Let's read some scripture together from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> For the message, the message of, of the cross, cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But, but to us who are being saved, saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, Greeks speak after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We're going to sing a song together in a moment, but before we do that, I just want to pray for us all right now. If you want to bow your heads, come into God's presence as we ask his blessing upon our gathering. And so, Lord, we come to you today in the name of the Lord Jesus. We come humbly and we come to receive from you. We ask, the Lord, that you will open our hearts to receive what you have for us. That by your Holy Spirit you will minister your word and your truth into all of our lives. We thank you, Father God, that we can gather here today with open doors in freedom to worship you here in Benidorm. We thank you, Lord, that we can sing these wonderful songs. We can lift up your name on high. We can exalt Jesus here. Because, Lord, Benidorm needs Christ. Lord, Spain needs Christ. Our world needs Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that when we preach Christ, we preach Christ crucified, as that passage told us. <coughs> Lord, that passage reminded us that there are people who look, after, who look for signs, and there's others who look for wisdom. But the message that we have is Christ crucified. And that may seem foolishness to so many, but to us who are being saved, it's the power and it's the wisdom of God. So we thank you, Lord, that we have church to come to this morning, to meet with other people, people that we know or people that we've never met before, but here with one purpose. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here to speak to us. And Lord, we do not in any way minimize that. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray, and speak, Holy Spirit, we pray. We do pray for this town of Benidorm. We thank you for its beauty, for the beautiful beaches, the beautiful weather. We thank you, Lord, for the, the helpfulness of the staff and the restaurants and the cafes. We know, Lord, that many are just struggling to make a living today. Lord, bless this time, we pray. But we also realize, Lord, that there's a dark side to Benidorm. A side, Lord, which is uncomfortable and which is very, very satanic. We pray against that in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that those who seek after pleasure and satisfaction in all the wrong places might even today be led to understand that only Christ can satisfy. And Father God, may they be led to repent of their sins, ask Jesus to forgive them, and come to know him who, who is life eternal. Thank you, Lord, for those that we've spoken to this week either formally or informally, those that we shared the message of the gospel with this week. We pray, Lord, to take this, the, the word that is landed in their hearts and apply it. But first of all, Lord, apply it to us. You know, the psalmist said, uh, Lord, will you not revive us again? And our prayer is, Lord, send us a revival, but let it begin with us right here. Thank you, Lord, for everyone gathered here today. We know, Lord, that they're not here by coincidence. They're not here by chance. They're not here by accident. But they're here by divine planning. 
And that gives us great confidence, Lord, to know that you have purposes for this service way beyond anything that we can imagine. We thank you for answering some of our prayers from last week, Lord. How we prayed for that little baby last week, lying in the breech position. And Lord, then we heard a couple of days later that the baby had turned and is ready for delivery. And we say hallelujah, praise the Lord. We thank you, Lord, how we heard from Eva that she's had complete um, uh, uh, good news this week about her treatment. Lord, we just thank you that you've answered so many prayers. Thank you for friends and family members, Lord. Sometimes we just wonder what we can do. And in times like that, there's nothing much we can do except pray and ask you, the God of heaven, to touch and intervene. So, Lord, be gracious to us today. Lord, we're humbly before you. We're, we're failing people, Lord. We're broken people. We're sinful people. We're not perfect. None of us are. Lord, we need your grace. So just help us, Lord, and may this be a very special hour for us today in the presence of God in this building. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand together and sing as the ladies and Richard lead us in the Lord is given, a land of good things. This is a, a song which reminds us about the triumph of the Christian church as we move forward. Because Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's on the screen, it's also in your book if you need it. You see the numbers will be on the screen as well of the song. Yeah. 
practical stuff like how do you share your faith, how do you read the Bible for yourself and so on. And we're going to have some community time, there'll be coffee, there'll be lunch, it's going to be terrific, isn't it? And uh, we have some of our friends coming out here, so there you go, mornings, about 10.30ish, uh, and then we'll go to two, we'll have some lunch together, uh, and then uh, days divided into two, in the evening, those, those, and it's not everybody's cup of tea, but do come in the morning or come in the evening or whatever, but it's all there for you. Grow and go, and we want to share the gospel that we've on this trip. Uh, I asked the people who were coming out to Benidorm, most of whom have never been to Benidorm before, to record a little video for you so that you could meet them. And nearly every one of them, their video was like really miserable, to be honest. It looked like they were really unhappy to come to Benidorm. Um, <laughs> Don't put that YouTube up and Anyway, here's Andrew. Andrew's a great guy. He's a good friend of ours. He's coming to Benidorm for the first time. Here's his video. I think his video is there, Ruth. If you want to play that. And Andrew's going to introduce yourself to him. I'll introduce him to you. Well, hello there. My name is Andrew. I'm from the beautiful city of Belfast. And uh, my job is to um, save lives on a daily basis. As I service people's gas boilers and appliances to keep them from blowing up and gassing themselves to death with it. Um, I've been a member of the uh, the Baptist Church for about 12 years now and um, very, very much looking forward to coming to Benidorm. Uh, I want to meet you all and hopefully uh, we will bless each other as we meet and exchange stories of our Christian life and uh, maybe you can share some of your beautiful weather with me. Because right now I'm in Bush Mills in the not so sunny side of the street. <laughs> we just finished our men's weekend and it was tremendous. Uh, very much looking forward though to um, heading east and we went south to the metropolis of Benidorm. Okay, uh, I hope this has been uh, informative and interesting and I look forward to uh, singing and standing and um, ministering with you. God bless. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew's a great musician. You'll love his music. He's He's really fantastic. You just need to smile a wee bit more. It's <laughs> hard to get the camera, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, God bless them. It's going to be that's going to be really, really good. And such a blessing to have uh, Carolina and Raquel. They're going to come sing to us in just a moment. They're going to sing to us in the Spanish language, um, and their song is based on Galatians chapter two, uh, verses nineteen to twenty-one. And so Ruth's going to come and read that for us in the Spanish language. If you know your Bible, you will know what this is. So Ruth will read it to us, um, and then Caroline and Raquel, accompanied by the others, are going to sing to us about Christ being crucified for us. <clears throat> mm. 
Gálatas 2, 19 hasta el 21. Yo, por mi parte, mediante la ley, he muerto a la ley, a fin de vivir para Dios. He sido crucificado con Cristo, y ya no vivo yo, sino que Cristo vive en mí. Lo que ahora vivo en el cuerpo, lo vivo por la fe en el Hijo de Dios, quien me amó y dio su vida por mí. No desecho la gracia de Dios. Si la justicia, si la justicia se obtuviera mediante la ley, Cristo habría muerto en vano. Amén. Christ being crucified for us. So we'll follow the ladies and uh, those of you who speak Spanish, sing up loud. Those of us who don't speak much Spanish, just bluff it, okay? <laughs> but do your best. Honor the Lord, okay? <laughs>
Louisa, just need a wee bit of translation for me. Okay. Well. Tell us a little bit what this song is, Carolina, and what your de your desire is for your daughter. Ah, quiere, quiere que nos digas cuál es esta canción que vas a cantar y cuál es nuestro <coughs> deseo para ti. Eh, mi mayor deseo en este día especial de cumpleaños para mí es su salvación, que Cristo esté en su corazón como está en muchos de nosotros. Y pues, bueno, a más que un regalo material, su salvación es primero. And what she wants to give a gift for her birthday is her salvation from God. Um, all the material things are lovely, but the most important thing for her is her daughter's salvation. That's lovely. So we, just before you, come on, yeah. En la canción de cumpleaños que le queremos cantar es feliz feliz cumpleaños y es es una canción donde dice que Dios en su bondad le dé muy larga vida salud y felicidad que no lo hemos cantado como es normal el happy birthday normal de todos los tiempos sino que es una canción deseándole lo mejor y que y que esté siempre Dios presente en su vida. So this birthday song isn't like the normal birthday song. It adds the element where it says, "May God's blessing accompany her for the rest of her life." So that's the version that they what they want us to sing. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's just sing it, and as you sing it, we're going to we're going to give up being a little cake. So maybe we should sing the normal happy birthday song first, should we? Yeah. Okay. Happy birthday to you.
come to this part in our service where we're going to focus on the Word of God. And you have an opportunity to listen to what God has to say to you. Many people want to hear what God has to say. Now when you want to hear what God has to say, there is 100% guaranteed way that you can hear what God has to say. And that is, read the Bible. It's God's Word. Okay? And so we're, we've been looking at the life story of this man called Joseph. And his story is told in the last 14 chapters of the first book of the Bible, the book called Genesis. And Joseph is a, such a great character. And even though this happened about 3,000 years ago, roughly, there are so many lessons in this story for us today. We've been going on this journey with Joseph. And we have seen that Joseph was obviously Jacob's favorite son. So much so that Jacob gave him, well, everybody knows what Jacob gave him, don't they? A coat of many, many colors. colors. He wore that coat. And it was a sign of royalty, actually. It was Jacob basically saying to the rest of his family, not only is Joseph my favorite son, but Joseph is the one who will achieve more and accomplish more and be of a higher status than any of the rest of you. That caused a lot of problems in Joseph's family, as you probably guess. Joseph lived in a very dysfunctional family. And that's what I love about the Bible, is when you read the stories in the Bible, they are very real. They don't paint perfect families. They don't show us a perfect individuals without flaws or, or, or mistakes. They show us people in the raw as they really are. Joseph's family was very dysfunctional. So much so, in fact, that his brothers hated Joseph. Can you believe that? To the extent that they planned to murder him. And as you know, there was an intervention by one of the sons, and they didn't murder him, but they sold him as a slave to Egypt. And so Joseph, having been the favored son, covered in the beautiful coat of many colors in his father's house, is now a slave in Egypt. But Potiphar, who bought Joseph, recognized that he was a very different young man. He was just 17 years of age at this stage. But Potiphar uh, promoted him in his house. Joseph had many responsibilities and many privileges in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife, as you know the story, in chapter 39, set her eyes upon Joseph. She had a sexual interest in Joseph. And Joseph was tempted by her, but did not yield to her. In fact, day after day after day, says the Bible, she pestered him. But Joseph said no. You know why? Because Joseph realized that he had the answer to God one day. He didn't have the answer to people, he had the answer to God one day. One day she grabbed him by his coat, his cloak, his outer garment, and he fled. He actually fled. He actually flew out of the room as fast as he could. He ran away from this woman. But she was left holding on to his cloak. Somebody once said it's better to lose a cloak than to lose a conscience. And it was for Joseph. And she had the evidence. Joseph ended up in prison, as you probably know. In prison, there's two other men there, a butler and a baker. We looked at that last week. The butler's an important person for Joseph. He, um, he is a, an important person in the household of Potiphar. He's really the food taster. He's really the security guard. But for whatever reason, these two other people, the butler and the baker, are in prison. They each have dreams, and Joseph's the dream guy. He understands dreams. So Joseph interprets the dreams for the butler and the baker. He says to the butler, one day you're going to be restored to your position. But to the baker, in three days, you're going to be executed for your crimes. We saw last week that Joseph was very faithful in, the, in declaring the bad news as much as the good news. He wasn't a people pleaser, Joseph. He wanted people to know exactly the truth. And his uh, interpretation of the dreams were so specific that within three days that's what happened. Now you may remember that they had said to the butler, when you get out of here, buddy, remember me. Okay, maybe he didn't say buddy, but you know me. Okay, when you get out of here, remember me. But when he got out of there, was restored to his position, he forgot Joseph. And so Joseph remained in prison for two more years. And that's where we pick up the story. And I called this message, them that honor me. 
And the chapter we're focusing on is Genesis chapter 41. So you can follow some of the verses in your Bible if you need to, or on your phone or on your device. The reason we put Bibles on your seats is because we want you to know that what we're saying here comes from the Bible. We don't make it up. And so therefore you can check it up. You can follow it with me as we go through this. But the reason I call it them that honor me is because in the Bible we're told that them that honor me, I will honor, says the Lord. So if we honor God with our lives, ultimately he will honor us. And that's exactly what Joseph did. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire. A long time ago now, maybe 30 years ago, maybe more than that. But the movie Chariots of Fire, I would say, has to be one of my favorite films of all time. And it tells the story, amongst other things, of, a, of an athlete called Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell was chosen to run for the United Kingdom, or I think it was probably Great Britain in those days, in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. That's 100 years ago next year. And Eric Liddell had uh, practiced uh, and was one of the favorites for the sprint race at the Olympic Games. But it was on his way to the Olympics that he was told that his, the heat of his event was going to take place on a Sunday. And Eric Liddell did not run on Sundays. That was just his conviction. Sunday was God's day, a special day. He didn't do that. So the Olympic uh, committee said, but you have to run. You can't, you, you can't let us down. We've chosen you for this race. Just go to church first and then run. And he said, no, I don't do that. I'm not going to run. And in the movie, and I don't know if this is entirely accurate of what happened, but in the movie you'll see that, that Eric Liddell is in a little church on a Sunday, worshipping the Lord. And as he's worshipping the Lord, you can hear the sound of the crowd in the Olympic Stadium nearby, cheering on the athlete. And the director of the movie paints this contrasting picture between the applause and the acclaim in the Olympic Stadium and Eric Liddell identifying with God's people in the church. But the story unfolds, as you probably know, that he got an opportunity to run another race. A race that probably he wasn't completely proficient in. I think the race was the 400 meters as opposed to the 100 meters. If you know anything about athletics, you know it's a completely different technique. Technicality, technicality required. And in the movie, as Eric Liddell is about to run the 400 meters, another athlete comes up and presses a piece of paper into his hand. And Eric Liddell opens the piece of paper before the race, and this is what it says on the paper. Them that honor me, I will honor, says the Lord. And you probably know the rest of the story. And Eric Liddell went on to be a missionary in fact, when Eric Liddell left Scotland to go to be a missionary, there were so many people in the railway station that turned up to wave him goodbye as he was taking the train on the first leg of his journey to missionary service, that the entire train station was packed with people standing and singing, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun shall his successive journeys run. Amazing. What an amazing man. And what an amazing legacy. But Joseph also had this legacy. Because he honoured the Lord. He honoured the Lord in the pit. He honoured the Lord in the palace. And he honoured the Lord in the prison. And there he is in the prison. And I want you, when you look at this story, not just to see Joseph, but to see Jesus. Because every part of our Bible points to Jesus Christ. And Joseph is a type of Jesus for us. He is an innocent man who has done nothing wrong. He is suffering the indignity of prison for something he did not do. Jesus Christ was put on the cross, was crucified as a common criminal for something he did not do. In one occasion he said, which of you accuses me of sin? And none of them could find anything to accuse him of. I can't say that. I, if I said to you, can you tell me what my faults are? There may be a long queue of people. And Maggie would probably be at the front of the queue. Right? Because none of us are innocent. But Jesus was innocent. And they put him on a cross for something he, could not, he did not do. And then, of course, our Lord Jesus is the saviour of the world. Those who judge Jesus will one day be judged by him. And these brothers judged their brother Joseph 
put him into a pit. And later on in the story, as you will see, he becomes their judge. They stand in front of him. And he has the power to do with them whatever he wants. Amazing. So don't just see Joseph. See Jesus. Now, I love patterns in Scripture. And in chapter 41, there are some patterns that I want you to see how God has woven some patterns into the text here. And the first thing we see are two years. In, in verse 1 of chapter 41, it says this, It came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Which river do you think he was standing by? Of course, it was the river Nile, wasn't it? The mighty river of Egypt. Two full years have passed. Don't miss that. So Joseph has been in prison for another 730 days. Day after day after day of drudgery and darkness and despair. And I'm sure in his heart, every day Joseph was listening and hoping that the butler had remembered to say a good word for him and that he would be released. But those days didn't come. And two Full years passed, and Joseph was still there. I'm sure that perhaps he was, was even tempted to take things into his own hands. Maybe he was tempted to escape, or he was tempted to try to formulate a, a way out. I'm sure the sense of discouragement and, and, and how disheartened he was would have sat really heavy with him. But I want you to see this, that Joseph doesn't do anything but wait. He just waits. His confidence, his trust, his hope is in his God. Now, waiting is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? It's the hardest thing to do. And Joseph just waits until God has his time. And here's the thing. If Joseph had been released before those two years, he might have said, oh, well, I don't really fancy this Egypt business. I'm off. I'm away back. I'm away back to the land. And if he had done that, then the story wouldn't have unfolded the way it did. And his brothers would never come down to Egypt. And the, the people would never have settled in Egypt. And there never would have been a lion. And there never would have been a Messiah. And there never would have been a salvation. And there never would have been a church. It was all because Joseph was prepared to wait. Waiting is the hardest thing. This is what somebody said. If we look only at the human side of trial, we shall become discouraged. <coughs> And it may be it may become irritated and angered. But as we turn to look at it from the divine side, we shall see God in everything and all things working together for our good. Amen? Amen? We only look at it from our side. We don't see what God's doing. Joseph had to wait those two full years. I want you to see another pattern in Scripture here. There are two dreams. And these dreams are held, are had by this man, Pharaoh. Now, if you're following the story, you'll be aware that uh, dreams pop up quite a lot in this story. And here we have G uh, uh, Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, and he has two dreams. So if in your Bible, if you've got your Bible open at Je Genesis chapter uh, 41, you will see uh, verse uh, Two explains that there came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking fat, and they fed in the meadow. And then seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and the gaunt cows ate up the seven fine looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh woke. And when he woke up, like you and I wake up after we've had a crazy dream, we go, Phew, what was that all about? <laughs> Ever had one of those dreams? Yes. I have. And you go, wow, what's that all about? It's crazy. Seven fat cows, seven thin cows, seven thin cows, eat up the seven fat cows. Then he has a second dream. This is his second dream, verse 5. He slept and dreamed a second dream. And this time he sees another seven, but it's not cows this time, it's heads of grain or, or stalks of corn. Seven healthy stalks of corn, but then in verse 6, seven thin stalks of corn. And the seven, verse seven, the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. Again, seven fat, 
healthy stalks of corn and seven miserable looking stalks of corn and the miserable ones eat up or devour the fat ones. And Pharaoh woke up and he went, oh, what was that about? <laughs> that sounds a bit similar to the first one. So he calls his magicians and he calls all the boys in and he says, come on, what's, what's all this about? And none of them had any idea what this was about. And I want you to understand something that's going on here. Pharaoh immediately knew that, that what was happening was significant with these dreams. But none of his people had the insight. In fact, verse 8 says, if you read it, his spirit was troubled. He sent and called for all the magicians and all the wise men. But none of them, none of them were able to interpret it for him. Then the butler steps forward. Do you remember him in the story? Remember that? He's the guy who was in prison with Joseph. And he steps forward and says, Pharaoh, I, I am so silly. I am so stupid. I remember when I was in prison, there was this prisoner there. Uh, two years ago, I think it was. And he, he interpreted my dream and he interpreted the baker's dream. And guess what? They came true. Maybe you should get him. Get him in. Maybe he's the guy. He's the dream guy. He will be able to help you understand what all this is about. And so it says here, if you read down the passage, we go to, to, to verse 10. He was angry with his servants, blah, blah, blah. He was really cross with them. Um, and the the, the uh, butler said, when, when you were angry and put me in the house, etc., and the <coughs> butler goes on to explain that Joseph's the guy. So go down to verse 14. Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the, the word there is dungeon. But give you an idea that this was not an easy time for Joseph. It's a dungeon. Right? And I love this bit, verse 14. What does Joseph do? He shaved, he changed his clothes, and he came to Pharaoh. You see, Joseph is a man who likes to honor people as well as honor God. And even though Pharaoh is a nasty bit of work, Joseph realizes he's an important person. So I'm not going to be slovenly. I'm not going to take a few minutes. I'm going to shave. I'm going to change my clothes. And maybe he asked the, the servants for a change of clothes so that he would be presentable when he came to Pharaoh. That's interesting. So then what we get, we've had two um, years and two dreams. Now we find two men face to face with each other. And the contrast couldn't be different. One of them is Pharaoh. He is the mighty ruler of the mightiest nation on earth at that time, which, is the, which was the nation of Egypt. He's the big shot. He's got servants in abundance. He's got palaces. He's got money. He's got everything he needs. And then you have standing in front of him a young man called Joseph. And Joseph is a Hebrew slave who has been rejected by his family, who has literally been dragged out of the dungeon for this moment in time to stand in front of Pharaoh. So let's sort of contrast those two men. Because if you read the text really carefully, you'll see that even though Pharaoh was a really important man, he has been deeply, deeply impacted by Joseph's life and witness. How do I know that? Well, you've got to go down a little bit down the chapter towards the end of the story. And if you go down to verse 37, later on in the story, um, verse 38 rather, Pharaoh said to his servants, his other guys, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Now, in our translation here in front of us, we've got capital S for spirit, capital G for God. It's unlikely, though, that Pharaoh was referring to the Holy Spirit. What he's really saying is, I have found a man who's different, and he seems to have something divine about him. You see, Pharaoh was a, was a polytheist, right? He believed in lots and lots and lots of gods, as the Egyptians did. So their biggest god was the sun god. Ra was the sun god. Right? And the sun was worshipped by the Egyptian. Which is one reason why God, when he wanted to get his children out of Egypt, blocked out the sun. 
Because God can do that, you know. Right? God can do that. And he wanted to show, it wasn't just a matter of plunging them into darkness. He wanted to show them that he was bigger, stronger, and more powerful than any god they had in Egypt. Including Ra, the sun god. Now the way the Egyptians looked at people like Joseph, a Hebrew, was with pity. Because they said, look, we've got loads of gods. We've got many gods. We've got sun and moon and stars and plants and flowers and trees and the river and everything's a god. We have loads of gods. You poor people, you only got one god. It's a bit like saying, I've got loads of money, loads of bank accounts. You've only got a few quid, a few euros in your bank account. That's how they saw that. And they didn't think much of Joseph's God. One small, paltry God. But something happens to Pharaoh standing in front of Joseph that impacts him. So here's what I want to say here. that You may just be you're an ordinary person. That you don't have much to offer in life. But when you honour God and God honours you, your life makes an impact on other people. Amen. And it's amazing that God would use someone like you and someone like me in that way. So that people are impacted for good by us, by Joseph, a slave, out of prison. Nothing to offer this mighty man Pharaoh. But there's something about his character and there's something about his testimony and there's something about his life that makes a difference on Pharaoh. Why? Because our life and our words always have an impact. A forensic scientist, as you know, when they're investigating a crime, would be able to find DNA evidence on everything. <coughs> If there was a crime committed in this building today, my DNA would be all over this pulpit. Richard's DNA would be all over the piano, right? And if the crime happened at the piano, Richard would be the chief suspect, right? Because his DNA is all over the piano. Because whether we like it or not, we're making an impact everywhere we go. In fact, the first law of forensics is this. Every contact leaves a trace. And every contact that you have with somebody else leaves a trace. And Joseph knew that. And so here's Pharaoh deeply impacted by Joseph's life and words. But here's Joseph. Let's shine the spotlight on the other man in the room right now. And Joseph is able to interpret the dream. So if you go down the, the chapter, verse 15 now we're on. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, there's no one who can interpret it, but I've heard said of you, that you can understand the dream to interpret it. Pause there for a second. Think of the pressure Joseph is on in this moment, right? He has to know what this dream, these dreams are all about. If not, Pharaoh's going to say, you are a useless Hebrew slave, get out of my sight. No matter how much he's been impacted, he realizes this is his moment. Joseph has to seize the day. What does he say? Verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So he brings God into his conversation. Do you see that? He's not ashamed of his God. He's not saying, oh, well, God will give the answer, but I don't want to mention God's name to the sky because he doesn't really like that. So I'll kind of skirt around it a little bit. And I'll say, it'll be okay, Pharaoh, we'll find an answer. He doesn't do that. He says, Pharaoh, God, my God, the God, the only true God, Yahweh God, he will give you an answer. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, okay, here's the dream. So Pharaoh starts to explain the dream to him. And then explains the second dream to him, starting in verse 22. So he says, Joseph, here's what I dreamt. Verse 25, Joseph interprets the dream. Joseph is the dream guy. And he's able to interpret the dream. And I want you to see what he says again in verse 25, if you're following the text. He says, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. 
Do you see how for a second time he brings God into the conversation? Right? He does it once. He says, okay, Pharaoh, give it your best shot. What are your dreams? Okay, Pharaoh, I want you to know this. God has shown you what he's about to do. And so Joseph interprets uh, Pharaoh's dreams. He tells them that uh, God has revealed to Joseph that there are going to be seven years of wonderful prosperity and abundance in Egypt. The, the barns will be full, the crops will be growing fantastically well, but lest they get too confident and cocky and arrogant about that, there are going to be seven years still coming after that that will be terrible. Famine, no crops, no produce, nothing. And so Joseph says, you know what you want to do, Pharaoh? Here's what you want to do. God's told me what you should do. You should appoint somebody, a man, a top civil servant. And during those seven years of prosperity, he will gather some in the barns. Even though people won't want to be given up. He should, he should do this. Why? Because you can be absolutely certain, Pharaoh, that there are going to be seven terrible years following, and you want to have some stuff saved up. Okay, there's a little principle there about how we should all see it in the good times that they are for the bad times, but that's not the primary purpose of the text, right? But it's hidden there for you. And so Pharaoh says, oh, that's a great idea. He says, I wonder who we could think of. Who would be a person to head that program up? This person's going to be really powerful because he's got the ability to, to, to take taxes. He said, I know. You're the man. You're the man. And he says, of course, here in verse 35, can we find anybody? Verse 38, sorry, verse 38. Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is the spirit of the gods. And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 39, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house. You, all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. In other words, in Egypt, this mighty land, Pharaoh's number one, Joseph is number two. I think you've got to admit, that's a pretty good story, isn't it? That's rags to riches right there, isn't it? From the pit, from the prison, from this dungeon, now he's number two in Egypt. Them that honor me, I will honor. Verse 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've said you all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took a signet ring off his hand. He put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him in garments of fine linen. He put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the second chariot which he had. Verse 43, and they cried out before him, by the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. What a promotion for Joseph. So he's been up in his father's house with the coat of many colors. Then he's down in the pit where the brothers put him. And then he's in Potiphar's household and Potiphar recognizes his character and elevates him to a lofted place in the household. And then Potiphar's wife accuses him in the wrong and Joseph's in prison. So he's up and he's down and he's up and he's down. His life it's more than the Big Dipper and Blackpool Pleasure Beach, right? He's up and down here. It's crazy. And now he's second in the land. It's remarkable. It's truly, truly, truly remarkable. He is at this stage about 30 years of age. It is 13 years since he left his father's house. 13 years since he saw his brothers. 13 years since they put him in the pit. 13 years since they said to him, adios mi amigo, off you go, we will never see you again. 30, 13 years. He's learned Egyptian. He's learned the culture. He's learned the language. He's learned how to conduct himself. But he's still in his heart of hearts a follower of the one true God. Do you know, you can live in a hostile environment, in a hostile culture, and still emerge with your conscience intact. So many people come to Benidorm and the Benidorm culture drags them down into a lifestyle they never wanted to know. You don't have to be that person. Joseph wasn't. 13 years in Egypt, through the pit, through the prison, through all that stuff, he's still honoring his God. He's still honoring his king. Now, so we've seen two years. We've seen two dreams. We've seen two men. 
There is one more thing in this chapter I want you to see. Joseph goes on to have two children. If you read down the rest of the passage, you see that Pharaoh gives Joseph a wife. Her name is Asina. She's a, a priest's daughter. Okay? Verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old. There's the age that you have there. And what happens, of course, is that the seven years of plenty come, of course, and Joseph is very wise in gathering up some of that food into the barns and as much as he could. And during those seven years between Joseph's 30th year and his 37th year, he goes on with Asenath to have two children. And as we land this message this morning, as we draw this message to a close, I want you to see what Joseph calls his children. Because it's really important. He didn't just give them a name that he just randomly picked from a hat or just looked up on the internet, even though he didn't have the internet. He gave them names that were significant and important for him and for us. And with this, if you're falling asleep, wake up. Because this is important. He called Joseph's name Zaphnath Panaya. Gave him a, he, a, a, an Egyptian name. He gave him as, as a wife, Asana. The daughter of Patiphera, the priest of Dawn. So Joseph went down over all the land of Egypt. And then he had a child. And he named him Manasseh. And Manasseh means forgetful. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh for this reason. God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's time. God made him forget. And here's the point. When you look at the text, the fact that Joseph says, my toil and my father's house, meant that it was still in his head, doesn't it? Still in his head. But what he means by forget it is that I no longer am dominated by my past. Right? Up until now, I've been dominated by the rejection, the terrible rejection of my brothers. The horrible thing they did to me. The tough times I've had in Egypt. But now, I, God has made me forget. Those things no longer have the power to hurt me. Now, there are many things in our lives, in our past, which constantly keep coming up. Right? And they have the power to hurt us. Time after time after time. And even though it may have been 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago or decades ago, some of those things have the power to hurt us. Broken relationships, failed businesses, damaged people, uh, wrong decisions, broken lives. And Joseph got the point in his life where he would not allow his past to define him anymore. God wants you to be in that place today. Many of you have got broken pasts. Do not allow your broken past to define you. Because if you're a Christian, you are a child of God. You're adopted into God's family. You're loved. You're honored. You're a child of the King. You're going to heaven one day. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have every riches of Christ at your disposal. Amen? Amen. So don't allow your past to define you. Something that somebody did to you or something you can't control. You're in the present now. And, God, and Joseph sat there and he said to his wife, I'm going to call this child Manasseh. Oh, why are we calling the child Manasseh? Because God has made me forget all my toil. And then he goes on to have a second child. And he says to his, his wife, we're going to call him Ephraim. Oh, Joseph, why are we calling him Ephraim? Because Ephraim means fruitful. And the name of the second called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my father. That's where we, in the land of my affliction, sorry. That's where we leave, Joseph. Can you, can you picture him here, right? Last week we left him in the pit, in the prison. Now he's sitting in his palace. <laughs> he's second in command of Egypt. He has chariots. He has servants. He has jewelry. He has signet rings. He has robes in abundance. He has a beautiful home. He's looking over his land that he has. He's got a lovely Egyptian wife. He's got two little children playing on the floor. Manasseh and Ephraim, the darlings of his heart. 
And they say, wow, God has definitely made me fruitful. Amen? But here's the thing. Before Joseph could have Ephraim, he had to have Manasseh. And before you can be fruitful, you have to be forgetful. If you allow the past to dominate you and control you and define you, you will never bear the fruit that you're meant to bear. But if, like Joseph, you get to a place and you go, Manasseh, then you're going to be fruitful. You're going to experience blessings that you've never known possible. And the devil will keep whispering in your ear, what about that? What about that person? And as, as the devil could have been whispering in Joseph's ear, as he sat there on his beautiful uh, seat, no doubt beside his swimming pool, uh, eating the best of food, and thinking back to all the past, and the enemy going, ah, but you see, your brother's here too. Ah, but your brother's put you in that pit. Ah, you see, your father, he, he doesn't care. He thought you were dead. He never came looking for you anyway. What sort of a person do you think you are, Joseph? Even the butler in the prison. You were so worthless, he couldn't even remember you when you had escaped. That's what the enemy would have been saying. And Joseph would have been going, aha, hold on something. Here. There's Manasseh. God's made me forget. And there's Ephraim. God has made me fruitful. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Rob, that the story of Joseph is a practical lesson for how you live your life today. In life, we need to let God help us to be forgetful. To overcome the hurts of the past. So that we can be very, what? Fruitful. In the present. I don't want you to see Joseph. I want you to see Jesus. Because Jesus himself was cast down. Jesus himself was rejected by his brothers. The Bible says Jesus came to his own. His own did not receive him. But the Bible also says this, that at the very name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And we're going to go on with the story. You're going to see some other stuff that's going to happen in Joseph's life. And eventually this wonderful time when his brothers stand in front of him and Joseph's got a decision to make. Do I kill them or do I forgive them? You want to come back for that, don't you? <laughs> don't miss it. But today, if you've never trusted Jesus as your saviour, I just want to say to you, Joseph's a wonderful man, but Joseph peels in the very poor, insignificant, but compared with the glory and the wonder of Jesus Christ, the one who created the world, the one who came as a baby to Bethlehem, the one who grew up to heal the sick, and raise the dead, and help the lost, and the one who said, come on, come to me, come to me. If you're weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. That's what becoming a Christian is all about. It's giving your life over to the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and saying, from now on, with all my brokenness, with all my failures, with all my sin, I want to follow you. When you do that today, I hope you will. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God has been so good to us today. We're going to sing a song as we move towards the end. Because I do feel that we're standing here on holy ground. So let's stand together as Richard and the ladies will lead us. We're standing on holy ground. If you want to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, then please do at the end of this service come forward. Uh, and talk to me and tell me that you this day have repented of your sin and ask Jesus to forgive you. And we look forward to seeing what God's going to do in your life and make you fruitful for this. Oh, God. <laughs> Amen. Yeah.
God has spoken to you today, um, I would expect that because it's his church, it's not our church. And uh, he often turns up and the Holy Spirit just speaks, prompts, nudges, challenges you in your heart. Maybe there was one sentence or one phrase or one something there which landed with you. That's not coincidence, that's God speaking to you. And you need to do something about that. So you can do that personally before the Lord. Maybe it's, this is the day, 21st of May, 23, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you're born again, when you're saved, you become a real Christian. Uh, maybe you need to make some changes in your life. Maybe you need to um, uh, say to the devil, stop annoying me about my past because God has made me forget. I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. I have no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you need to make commitments going forward that you're going to have done with a sinful lifestyle and you're going to live for Jesus from now on. I don't know. It's his purposes. I just turn up. That's all I do. Prepare and preach and then leave the outcome with God. It's his work. I can't make it happen. I can't force it to happen. I can't change it or alter it or manipulate it. It's up to God. Whatever God's done in your life. And if you need to speak to me, please feel free to do that. Let us praise Jesus. to go to no one, no one except the Lord Jesus himself, because he is worthy of it all. He is worthy of it all. And we praise his name. Amen. Amen. Let's just round off by singing this wonderful song, To God Be the Glory. Great things he has done. Uh, come on, you've sung well so far, so we'll do well in this last song.
Sunday morning. Uh, would you want to be sitting at home watching TV or you want to be here? You want to be here, don't you? This is an exciting place to be. God is at work here. And I want to just ask God to bless you as you go today. He is the King of Kings. He is the one true God. Let me pray for you and then we'll say the grace to one another. Lord, bless my dear friends here this morning with the blessing of God that makes rich and has no sorrow with it. Whatever they may need spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially today, may you meet their needs. May you show yourself to be the one true God. Part us, Lord, we pray, in the blessing of God upon us. So when we leave this place, we go to our hotels, or our apartments, or onto the beach, or into a restaurant, we might sense God is with us. May it be so. Let's say the grace to one another. The grace, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. God bless you.